The Indians of Cass County, Michigan, extracted from The History of Cass County, 1825 to 1875, and written by Howard S. Rogers. Uh, this was edited by Dennis M. Morrison. When Father Alouez and Dablo first visited Green Bay in 1670 for the purpose of establishing a mission, they found the country in the possession of a tribe of Potawatomi Indians. The extent of their possessions, or the number of their tribe, is not given, but from the important position they afterwards occupied, it is safe to presume that their possessions were widespread and that their tribe numerous. This is the first record we have of the existence of this people or their whereabouts. In 1675, Marquette made the voyage in open boats up the west shore of Lake Michigan for the purpose of establishing missions among the Indians. He first landed where Chicago now stands, and it being late in the fall, went into winter quarters. On this voyage, he was accompanied by Illinois and Potawatomi Indians. This is the first trace of the Potawatomis coming as far south as the extremity of Lake Michigan. How soon after this they left their home on Green Bay to inhabit a more genial clime, or whether the change was more gradually at, one, or at once, history does not state. But a portion of them settled on Saginaw Bay, others on the banks of the Detroit, and still another portion located on the east shore of Lake Michigan in the vicinity of St. Joseph River, while another portion settled in northern Illinois. The precise dates of these migrations cannot be given, but they were in the vicinity of Detroit and on the St. Joseph River about the middle of the last century, and have not been known at Green Bay in the last hundred years. It was a powerful tribe and constituted about one-fourth of the Algonquin Confederacy, and was among the last to give up its place to the encroaching white man. The Algonquin Confederacy was one of the most powerful combinations that was ever formed among the Indians of the West, and made its power felt in their alliance with the French against the English under the leadership of Pontiac. The Ottawas, Potawatomis, and Chippewas were closely related in all their op operations, and made common cause in avenging the death of Pontiac to the extermination of the Illinois, once the most powerful race that inhabited the prairie country. The extermination of the Illinois gave the almost unlimited sway, and their possessions were extended far into Wisconsin on the north, south to the Wabash, and east to Lake Erie. The Sauk and Fox Indians went uh, west of the Mississippi River, where their constant enemies and, um, all, and almost continual warfare was kept up between the two contending parties for the possession of the disputed territory. To what extent the Potawatomis assisted the British in the War of 1812 is not definitely known, but some of the young braves did take part against the Americans um, is a well-established fact. During the Black Hawk War of 1832, as a tribe, they remained loyal to the United States, but it was with great difficulty that the young men could be restrained from participating with the Sox and Foxes. When the settlers first came to this country, they found it occupied by three bands of this tribe of Indians, comprising in all about 400. In the western part was the Pokagon family of about 250 occupying the prairie that still bears the chief's name. In the northwest was Wesaw's band of about 100 occupying Little Prairie Round, and in the southeast the Shavehead family of about 50 with their summer quarters on Baldwin's Prairie. These people were domestic in their habitats, or habits, following the pursuit of agriculture as well as the chase in obtaining a livelihood. Their farms, or more properly gardens, were usually in the timber bordering on the prairies. Uh, these were fenced against their ponies, uh, the only stock which they kept, by felling a small uh, timber into a uh, windrow on three sides, and on the fourth side, next to the prairie, poles laden crotches formed the, protective, or the protection of their crops. The timber within the enclosure was girdled sufficiently to kill it, and the tops cut off thirty or forty feet above the ground. Their mode of cultivation was of the most primitive character, and performed almost wholly by the hoe, from the breaking up of the sod to the cultivation after planting. 
and each succeeding year the grain was planted on the same spot as the preceding year and the cultivation continued until it would lo no longer produce when another place was selected and the process was repeated. Of their productions, corn was the staple, while pumpkins, potatoes, and melons, all, all the small varieties, were raised in, uh, in limited quantities. The manner of securing their corn was uh, to thoroughly dry it at harvest time and store it away in holes in the ground. For this purpose, a quantity of bark was peeled each year and kept ready for use, and when it came time for securing the crop, a place was selected in a convenient thicket of brush, the sod carefully removed and placed, by, placed um, handy by, while the soil was carried in baskets and thrown in the nearest stream, for the purpose of leaving no trace of their concealed treasures. When the hole was finished, it was filled with dry combustible material and buried out and burned out, after which it was lined with bark, the corn put in, and covered with the same material. When the sod, take, uh, when the sod taken off would be replaced, making a secure compartment against the elements as well as against any um, light-fingered gentry that might be passing that way. How long grain could be kept in this matter? Uh, manner is a matter of conjecture, as with the Indians it seldom rested beyond one winter, but that uh, the period might be as was further protracted to is illustrated by the fact that in the spring of 1827 a squaw and her son came to the house of Baldwin Jenkins from the north and opened one of these bins within a few rods of the house and took out the contents, which was in good condition, and the family not having once suspected that the treasure was so near to their door. After securing their crops, the band would start on a hunting expedition, which would occupy the entire winter. The hunting grounds were some distance from the summer quarters and periodically changed for the purpose of letting the game accumulate, showing a providence that is rarely accredited to the Indian. In the spring, they would repair to their uh, sugar-making grounds and occupy the season in making and storing a supply of sweets for the year, after which they would return to their summer residence. The corn was reserved until this time, unless the chase had been unsuccessful, or other untoward circumstances drove them to break um, in upon their stores. Of their habits and customs, but little um, new can be said. Their language was expressive and composed of but a uh, few words, each of which had numerous meanings, and in talking was accompanied with gestures as expressive as the language itself. Their marriages were contracted by the parents, without ceremony, and the friends came together bringing much such presents as were suitable to the standing of the people, of the couple. If after living together for a time they found their temperament was not compatible, or if from any other cause they wished to separate, they were free to do so and could um, be married again to their liking. Their manner of burial has been commented, commented on by many writers, and much speculation indulged in upon the subject. The peculiar manner of dispose, disposing of the dead, some hung on trees, others in a sitting posture, others in pen, pens, while a few were entombed in troughs hollowed out from the uh, trunk of trees. Some, with all their worldly goods surrounding them, and a supply of provisions um, kept by them for a long time, has given rise to many theories on the subject. But with the Indians, these all had a special meaning, and any one of the tribe passing through a strange land could tell the rank, or if the subject had committed any serious crime or was a noted brave, it was plain to them as the uh, marble tablet is to us. This is illustrated by the fact that in some of their earlier journeyings around the south end of Lake Michigan, a woman whom they all respected named Mimis Noqua, brave lady, was taken sick and died, and the last words she said were, Here let my people eat. A tight pen was built over her grave in which was deposited a quantity of dried venison, berries, etc., that any of the tribe coming that way, hungry, could stop and eat. This was kept up as long as the tribe continued to travel on that trail. Many of the early settlers will remember how the Indian babies were strapped to a board, a seemingly inhuman practice, but, uh, but by them uh, deemed necessary, as they reasoned that to keep the child straight would make uh, a straight man, which was the pride of the nation. Anyone who has seen their children thus treated and noted the smiles of the little fellows when the bells tinkled on 
shaking the board, and the convenience of disposing them against their will, or any of the w um, or any out of the way place, does not wonder at the mode as practiced by these simple people. Their manner of disposing of old and decrepit persons was um, as summary as effective. Whenever they became useless or could not take care of themselves, they were put out of the way. A case of this kind occurred in the spring of 1860 near the northeast, northeast corner of Young's Prairie, where a band had wintered when the uh, party was ready to move, one old squaw was unable to go along. A committee took her in charge, cut a hole in the ice, and deposited her therein when the, uh, and when the band proceeded on its way. In July 1829, John Baldwin, for whom Baldwin's Prairie was named, had some difficulty with the Indians in regard to a yoke of cattle, which he had bought of them and paid for in whiskey. It is claimed by some that a yoke of oxen was, brought, was bought by the Indians, and by others that the Indians shot an ox for Baldwin, crippling him, when Baldwin compelled them to buy the ox, and afterwards brought it back and paid for it in whiskey, as stated. The Indians' ground for complaint was that the whiskey was watered so much that it would not make them drunk. One night, in harvest time, they came after he had gone to bed, armed with clubs, gainted mittens, and demanded um, the matter be made right. Baldwin denied the charges, jumped out of bed, and toward the fireplace where he had a stick of timber drying for a scythe snaff, which he hoped to get to, to defend himself. The Indians anticipated his movement and were ahead of in time to fell him with a club. He called to his son Joel, a young man sleeping in an adjoining room for help, who coming outside the door found it guarded by Indians. He then went in and jumped through a small window between the two rooms, but was caught by the Indians who pulled his shirt over his head, at the same time assuring him that if he was quiet no harm would befall him. The Indians continued to beat Baldwin until they supposed him dead, after which they drew him into the doorway, and on leaving each one jumped upon his body, at the same time uttering an unearthly yell. After the Indians left, the young man, with the assistance of the children, got his father onto the bed and found that he still breathed. Leaving him in charge of the children, Joel mounted a horse and aroused the neighbors, little thinking that he would be alive on getting back, but when the neighbors came in, it was found that he still lived. Dr. Loomis of White Pigeon was sent for, who dressed his wounds, which were mostly on the head, one side of which was half-skinned and the balance badly beaten. Baldwin recovered from his injuries, uh, put in a bill against the Indians for damages to the agent, and was, ho uh, and was allowed nearly $3,000, which was taken out of their annuities. Top Enneby was the acknowledged leader of the Grand um, Sechem, and held sway over the various tribes of Potawatomies of the Northwest. In 1795, as head chief, he signed the treaty which ceded all of southern Ohio to the United States. His name also appears on various other treaties at different times in which the secession of lands was made in northern Ohio and nearly all of Indiana and Michigan and parts of Illinois and Wisconsin. His name in the Indian language sig signifies peacemaker, and from the characteristics of the man it would seem that he merited the appellation. At the time of the threatened invasion by Black Hawk, the Indians were in council near Niles when Topenibi advised his people to keep on neutral ground, assigning as a reason that they would soon have to remove beyond the Mississippi and it would be better for them not to take sides with either party. When he was through, Oto Opto Gomi, meaning half day, arose and said the reason for such advice as this was that Topenibi was a coward. At this, the old chief threw over to him a butcher knife, at the same time binding him to, or bidding him to defend himself. At the first thrust, Topenibi drove the knife nearly through his body, and for years a white flag was kept flying over the dead Indian's grave. He, in common with the other members of his tribe, were removed, was removed to the west in 1838. Pokagon was next in command to Topenibi, and by many was considered the ideal red man of the forest, uh, but by the Indians in the early times he was held in derision and received his name signifying rib from the fact that at, a mass, at the massacre of Chicago he killed a pregnant white woman and cut her under the ribs, extracting the child. His original name was Sakok. Uanik. He married a daughter of 
Topenebi's brother, which was uh, being a good talker, placed him in the position of chief of his band and second in command of the Potawatomis. His home was on the west side of the prairie that bears his name. He early became a convert to the Catholic faith and adhered to it through life, uh, and set a good example for his band by abstaining from spirituous liquors. By the Treaty of Ch uh, at Chicago in 1833, Pokagon and his band were exempted from being removed beyond the Mississippi in common with the other Indians. His objection to being removed was the fear that they would lose the faith and civilization that they had attained and refuse to sign the treaty unless the privilege of remaining was guaranteed to him. When the other Indians were taken away, Pokagon purchased a large tract of land in Silver Creek Township where he remained until his death in 1841. He gave largely of his possessions to the church of his faith. In 1839, Pokagon was taken very sick and thought he was going to die, whereupon he sent for a priest who, on coming, refused to confer absolution unless 40 acres of the land were deeded to him. <laughs> this Pokagon acceded uh, to, the priest making out the papers, but upon the recovery of the chief, a short time later, the deed proved not to be... Um, for the 40 acres but about 700 and a lengthy litigation was necessary to recover it back. We saw the third in command of the Potawatomis occupied the northeastern portion of the county making his home in the summer season and on the farm now owned by B.G. Buell Esquire on Little Prairie Rond. His winter quarters were on the Dowagic Creek and on the farm of Honorable George Newton, where he had wigwams for the 20 families co uh, constituting his band. He made sugar in the northwestern portion of the township of Olenia, near the farm of the late Daniel C. Squires. We saw is described as a man fully six feet high, finely formed. His carriage was proud and erect, and when dressed in his suit of blue broadcloth, of which he was very proud, he made a, 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 a fine appearance. His favorite mode of dressing, however, was in the true Indian style, and as directed by those that saw him with a large sober ring in his nose, one in each ear, a breastplate of the same material as large as a pie tin, his leggings adorned with a row of bells that tinkled every step, a blue sash tied around his body, and a turban on his head of the same gay color, all combined to give impression of the true Indian grandeur. He had three wives, of whom one of, was the daughter of Topenebi, and was the favorite, and on marches and important occasions was allowed to take the station nearest to him. We saw was a friend of the whites, and always evinced a desire to cultivate their acquaintance and friendship. In 1827, while the surveying party were working north of the Big Swamp, their packer got lost and could not find them for several days, in which time provisions ran very low, and it became necessary to send out two men to procure supplies. Mr. Orlean Putnam and another man were detailed for this purpose and went to Weesaw's encampment on Little Prairie Rond a pers um, to procure the necessary supplies, arriving just at night. On making their wants known, the most hospitality was shown them, and immediately the squaw set about preparing food to be taken to the party. They were given a separate tent to lodge in, and at the same time asked to uh, guard the firearms that were brought to their place, as there was a general drunk among the braves of the band, and a number of times during the night the squaws came and peeped in to see if all was safe. In the morning, we saw, and his favorite wife accompanied the party some distance away, assisting them in carrying the provisions. And at this time, there was no white inhabitant near the Polkagon Prairie. In the spring of 1830 or 1831, we saw wished to move from his winter quarters to the sugar-making grounds, but owing to the indisposition of one of his wives, who had been badly hurt in a drunken brawl by an Indian who had, with a sharp stick, prodded nearly all the joints of her body, making it impossible to move her with, the, with their means of conveyance. He came to Jonathan uh, Gard for assistance and wished him to take his ox team and, and uh, move her. Mr. Gard, fearing that in her critical condition something might happen and blame be attached to him, evaded the chief by telling him that the oxen were in the woods and he did not know where to find them. To this we saw replied, me find them, and immediately set out in pursuit of the oxen, and on the next morning drove them up. 
A, a long sled was prepared with litter and the squaw carefully loaded on, uh, but in going through the woods they came to a large log that was impossible to get around. Mr. Guard improved a, improvised a bridge of uh, such small poles as they could pick up and instructed we saw as uh, the sled came to a balance to ease it down so as not to jar or hurt her. The idea struck him so forcibly that he clapped his hands for joy at its success. The trip was made in safety, but the poor woman, owing to the serious nature of her wounds, lived but a few days after their, her removal. We saw held, or assumed to hold, for a number of years a grant of three miles square on the south side of Little Prairie Rond, taking in a portion of Guards Prairie and the creek intervening, but no attention was paid to his claim by the settlers, and about 1832 he removed his band to the western part of Berean County. Shavehead and his band of nine families occupied the southern, southeastern part of the county and a portion of the time wintered east of Young's Prairie. The chief received his name from the peculiar manner in which he wore his hair. It was being nearly shaved off, leaving only a lock on top and a small portion on the back of his head, which was trained down behind, giving him a very peculiar as well as savage appearance. He was of a sullen, morose, dis or morose disposition, and always seemed to feel that the settlement of the con county or country by the whites was an intrusion upon the Indians' rightful domain, in which it was, and treated them accordingly. This was carried so far on several occasions that it came near costing him his life for the impu impudence and desecration. At one time he came to the house of Reuben Pegg on Young's Prairie, while that gentleman was from home, and demanded of Mrs. Payne uh, some, or Pegg some tallow to use on his gun, which she told him she did not have. This so enraged him that he threatened her until she was frightened nearly to death. Mr. Um, Pe Pegg, coming home soon after and being informed of what had ha transpired, cut an ox gad and followed after and overtook the Indian near old Mr. Green's when he gave him a severe castigation with an abomination to keep uh, scarce in the future. On another occasion, as Mr. Sabori, Sabori of White Pigeon Prairie was returning home from Carpenter's Mill, where he had been to get uh, a grist ground, his team was stopped in the woods by this Indian, who stepped from behind the tree and took hold of the leaders, at the, time, uh, at the same time demanding a bag of meal for the privilege of passing through his country. Mr. Um, Sabori told him to let go of the horses and come and take what meal he wanted, which Shave had proceeded to do, but hardly got his hand over the side of the wagon box when it was struck with the butt of the, of the uh, heavy laden whip in the hands of the driver, knocking him senseless to the ground and falling between the forward and back wheels of the wagon, from whence he was dragged by Mr. Sabori and left lying beside the trail more dead than alive. Many incidents of like nature could be related going to show the character of the man, uh, but these will be sufficient for the time. He never signed any of the treaties releasing the Indian title to the lands, consequently was cut off from their annuities, which perhaps may account for his manner of treating the whites. He died in 1837 or 1838 near Pawpaw, this state, a uh, lake of section 19 of Peterson Township commemorates his name.